Bring me that horizon. If we can and welcome to Xbox Game Showcase Extended. I'm your host, Paris Lilly. You may also know me from Gamertag Radio and Kinda Funny. I'm excited to be here with you today. We just saw a recap of Sunday's Xbox Showcase and wow, 30 games from some of the world's most talented developers and 27 of those games are coming to you on Xbox Game Pass. We saw the first in-engine footage of Starfield and learned that yes, Bethesda is bringing it to Xbox, PC, and day one on Game Pass exclusively. They also showed us Battlefield 2042, Sea of Thieves, A Pirate's Life, Stalker 2, Psychonauts 2, and how about Redfall? Like they said, this year, Xbox is all about the games. Today, Xbox Game Showcase Extended is our chance to hear from the developers behind the games that are redefining interactive entertainment. Developers like Double Fine, Playground Games, Supergiant, Rare, 343 Industries, and more. We also have a new accessory design program to share with you and a couple of other cool surprises. That's enough talk. Let's jump right in. <laughs> You can see it for yourselves, Forza Horizon 5 looks phenomenal. And here with us today, all the way from the UK, is Mike Brown from Playground Games. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, great to be here. Now, Mike, Forza Horizon has taken driving fans to Colorado, France, Italy, Australia, and the UK. How did you decide on Mexico for Forza Horizon 5? Yeah, so we knew right from the start that we wanted it to be the largest horizon yet. Um, but it's not far down the path from that that you realize you don't want to go big if it's just going to be more of the same. So we also knew that it needed to be the most contrasting, most diverse open world we'd ever built. And then when you start to look at Mexico, it, it really is like the whole world in one country. It's got snowy peaks, tropical jungles, epic canyons, amazing beaches, beautiful architecture, incredible historic cities, but also modern cities as well. It really has everything. And then you add in the culture, the music, the artwork, the people, the history, and there really is no more exciting location for the Horizon Festival. Now that we're in Mexico, what are some of the authentic elements that we can expect in the game? 
Yeah, totally. So we've got the largest and most diverse world we've ever built. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, something that really excited us about Mexico is the culture. So we've worked with creatives from all across Mexico. We've had Mexican artists produce beautiful mural artwork that you'll find on the walls around the game. We've worked with Mexican music acts to produce original compositions for the game. We've worked with Mexican scriptwriters and actors so that all of those Mexican voices you hear in the game will sound really authentic. And perhaps not as obvious, uh, but the other thing that is super authentic is uh, all of our light data and skies. So we had a team out in Mexico uh, with our 12K HDR sky capture rig. We captured more than 400 hours of sky data, and then we recreate that in game. Um, so all of the, the light, the shadows, the color information, uh, all of it is recreated in game based on real light data captured from Mexico. So everything you're seeing there is, just has that real authenticity, that, that, that feeling of, of reality. Now, we got a peek at Event Lab. Now, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so Event Lab is a, a really exciting uh, new suite of tools that will allow people in the community to create w whatever they can imagine, really. If we look at the video right now, all of this that we see has been built uh, using that Event Lab tool set. Uh, the bowling pins that have been placed, so someone's gone along, they've placed those, and then they've created rules that touch on them as well. So as we see, every time they're hitting them, uh, a rule has been set up such that it gives, gives players points. And then also in that, in that clip, you can see that everyone else in that multiplayer session is hitting bowling pins as well well, and all of that is adding into a collective team score. Uh, the rules could have easily been set up so that it wasn't a team score, that it was competitive. All of that creative freedom is, is, is open to players. It's, as, as a game designer, I think it's the feature that I'm most excited about in, in Forza Horizon 5. And I would say as a gamer, it's a feature I'm definitely excited about because this really is going to open up some unique features between me and my friends. Now, with the power of the Xbox Series X and the S, what are some of the new technical features that we can expect? So in, in Forza Vista, we're really able to turn up everything, ramp everything on, turn on ray tracing, and we have the cars looking more realistic than they ever have before, unparalleled detail. But that detail, it does apply to the rest of the world as well. During the uh, Xbox E3 showcase the other day, I mentioned we'd modeled the detail on everything, right down to the individual needles on the Choya cactus. Uh, that was just the plants that happened to be closest to the camera at that point. Um, that, that level of detail is applied to everything that you see. And Thanks to the power of the Xbox Series consoles, it's not just things that are right in front of the camera as well. We've really been able to push out all of the, the LODs and the draw distance and everything so that everything in the scene is full of that detail. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we capture that light data from Mexico. So you get this realistic lighting, shadows, AO, all of it comes together to create a scene that just looks real. Now, Mike, when can the world expect to play Forza Horizon 5? Sure. So we're launching this holiday on the Xbox Series consoles, the Xbox One consoles. We're on PC, on both the Windows 10 Store and Steam. Of course, we're in Game Pass and Game Pass Ultimate. And you can play us on your Android device with Xbox Cloud Gaming. And players who purchase the Premium Edition, or if they're a Game Pass subscriber and get the Premium Add-ons bundle, you'll get early access as well. So you'll be able to play a little bit earlier than everybody else. Now, Mike, this was a huge moment for you and the team. What does this mean to you? Yeah, well, for me personally, I mean, I've been working on the Forza franchise for a really, really long time, but this is my, this is my first game as creative director, so in this period over the last few days and, and week or so, as people are seeing it for the first time, for me, it's probably been one of the most exciting experiences of my life. It's been absolutely incredible. Again, Mike, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Later in the show, we'll be hearing from the developers behind games like Age of Empires 4, Shredders, and Grounded. But first, the team at Ninja Theory has something to share with you. Here's Tamim, Chief Creative Ninja, to explain what they've been hard at work on for Hellblade 2. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our brand spanking new Ninja house in Cambridge. I wanted to give you an update on the work so far for Senua Saga Hellblade 2. What we're doing right now is building a good chunky slice of the game before we then move into full production to build out the rest. Hellblade was very special for us, and we didn't want to do a straight sequel. We wanted to do something extra special. And so we're making our lives as difficult as possible in that pursuit. The game is set in Iceland, 9th century Iceland. So we've been sending out art and audio teams out there, doing photography, photogrammetry, and combining it with satellite data to recreate large swathes of the landscape. On the character front, we're building real costumes, scanning them in. We're collaborating with Epic Games to bring you next generation digital characters. On the combat front, we want it to be extra real and brutal, 
And so Melina, our main actress, has been training for two years and all of our animators have undergone combat training. And so what you're going to see here is not a trailer, it's not a gameplay reveal, but rather a montage of the kind of work we've been up to. Hope you like it. Will you follow me on this journey by sea, by land, and dreams through the valleys of despair, over the mountains of rage? To the depth of fear in my mind, you might see me as weak, but I will show you what lies behind my eyes. With our swords, we will forge new stories to strike the gods that haunt us. We will embrace our suffering, soothe our scars of grief, and break the siege of our minds. They may see them as gods, but we... We will show them what lies behind our eyes. Gau ari au fiatli in this nyota. Xbox Design Lab. And here to tell us more about Xbox Design Lab is Naveen Kumar. Naveen, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ferris. So, what is Xbox Design Lab? Design Lab is a controller customization service on Xbox.com where you can choose nearly any color combination you want for your controller and really make it yours. Uh, you can design a controller based off your favorite video game character, your favorite sports team, or whatever inspires you. And you can think of Design Lab as your own personal design studio. Now, we've originally launched Design Lab uh, five years ago and have since sold millions of controllers to fans around the world. But then we had to take a pause as we brought up our latest generation of Xbox hardware. But now we're back offering customization on the latest generation Xbox wireless controller. Now, we have so many awesome controllers here right now. Can you kind of talk a little bit about them? Yeah, well, right off the bat, you can see there's tons of color options to choose from. For most of the parts on the controller, uh, you can choose among 18 different colors for all the different, different pieces on the exterior. Uh, three of those colors are brand new to Design Lab. We have Shock Blue, Pulse Red, and my personal favorite, the Electric Volt color. Most of the colors uh, include post-consumer recycled resins in them. So there's a, a portion of, of things that are ground up, like automotive headlights, uh, recycled water bottle jugs, uh, things that make the controller more eco-friendly. We also have new button options for the ABXY button set and the view menu share, including a really cool button option uh, for ABXY that's a throwback to the original Xbox 360 controller. So you gotta check that out. And um, yeah, this is just the beginning. We're excited to, to introduce more customization options over time. Now, two of these controllers were inspired by games. Can you talk about that? 
Yeah, so there's a, a blue and green and purple one that's inspired by Psychonauts 2. We just love the key art for that one, so we work with our partners uh, to develop a controller to help bring that to life. And there's also one that's inspired uh, by Grounded and the aphid character from that game. Uh, we had a lot of fun in designing that as well, as a controller kind of looks like an aphid if you look at it yeah. uh, from the right angles. Now, I created my own controller. I'm going to pick it up now. I'm a huge Los Angeles Lakers fan world champion Los Angeles <laughs> Lakers. And my design was inspired by that. So I went with the yellow on the front. I went with the purple on the back. Um, I designed the buttons kind of with the black accent along with the, uh, the shoulders and, and the triggers. Um, but I also did an inscription on it. And my inscription says, Ka can't cook. And that is inspired by my good friend, Khalif Adams. He does a fantastic show called Spawn on Me, but he's a terrible cook. So I want to make sure that every time I pick up a controller to play on Xbox, I'm reminded how terrible of a cook he is and to avoid it at all costs. But enough of terrible cooking. Let's talk about something that you designed. Yeah, I designed this controller right in front of me here. Uh, again, on my favorite color, this electric volt. I just love the way uh, that the midnight blue accents pop against it, the dark ABXY colors. Uh, and this one's inspired by a pair of sneakers I have at home. So I had to make a controller based off yeah. that. That's awesome. Now, one last thing. When can fans expect to start designing their own Xbox controllers? They can start today by visiting xbox.com slash Xbox Design Lab. There's tons of inspirations to choose from. Uh, Customization is really fun. And we're shipping controllers to US, Canada, and most Western European countries. And uh, these make great gifts, whether it's for yourself or that special gamer in your life. That is fantastic. Naveen, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Paris. Later in the show, World's Edge will give us a deeper look at Age of Empires 4. But first, Tim Schafer is giving us a closer look at Psychonauts 2. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Schafer from Double Fine Productions here today to take a deeper look into Psychonauts 2. Psychonauts 2 is an action adventure game starring Rasputin Aquato, a powerful young psychic, also a trained acrobat, who ran away from his circus home to join the Psychonauts and expand and explore his psychic abilities. One of Raz's most important psychic abilities is that of astral projection, which allows him to project his psyche into someone else's mind and see their mental landscape made real. He can help them wrestle with their inner demons and fight their actual nightmares in person. Which means that the levels in the game are actually brains, and Psychonauts 2 has even more brains than the first game. One of the first brains you'll get to visit is that of Caligosto Lobato. Now, Dr. Lobato was actually a villain in the first game, but after Raz fought him, they kind of became friends. He actually has a piece of information that Raz wants, which is who kidnapped Truman Zanotto. And Dr. Lobato wants to tell you, but he can't because of something going on deep in his unconscious mind. So Raz has to travel along with Sasha and Mia and Coach Oleander into his mind and try to extract that information. And there's a lot of forces at work inside Lobato's mind, maybe put there by someone else, who are trying to stop you, including some of uh, the enemies that you might recognize from the first Psychonauts game, including the sensors, entities designed to stamp out thoughts that don't belong in someone's mind, including Raz, who doesn't belong here. But you also see a lot of new enemies, such as doubts and regrets. Lobato's mind is plagued with doubts and regrets, and they're very dangerous for Raz. Did I mention there's a lot of teeth? Have I mentioned there's a lot of teeth? There's a lot of teeth. He's an amateur dentist. He doesn't know a lot about teeth, but he really, really likes them. Luckily, to fight all these enemies, Raz will have his psychic powers, including his powerful psychic punch, where he has these hands that extend psychically from his body into a powerful melee combo. He also has his psychic blast, where he can shoot a powerful energy beam out of his brain. Raz also has the ability of pyrokinesis. It's always handy to be able to burn things with your mind. And levitation. Raz can use his own thoughts, his own thought bubble over his head as a balloon to float around or ride around on to get somewhere really quickly. So with these new powers, Raz can fight all these new enemies and hopefully find out who kidnapped Truman Zanotto. Now, while Truman's been kidnapped, the person running the Psychonauts is Hulls Forsyth the second head of the Psychonauts. Hollis is also the head of the intern program, which is what Raz has joined now that he's become part of the Psychonauts. And he is invited into Hollis's brain for instruction. Hollis is teaching him a new psychic ability called mental connection, where you can see two thoughts in someone's mind and connect them, sometimes creating new thoughts, making new things happen. While Raz is training in mental connection inside of Hollis's mental classroom, he experiments a little too far and accidentally, maybe slightly on purpose, creates a lot of interesting gambling inside of Hollis's mind because he wants to go on the mission to the Lady Lactopus Casino. Unfortunately, this connection leads to more connections and eventually the whole thing gets out of Raz's control and Hollis gets 
way too interested in gambling. And uh, Raz has to go back into her mind where he finds out that her memories of medical school and where she studied neurology have been corrupted by this gambling interest and it becomes a casino hospital. And Raz has to actually go in there and engage with all these gambling machines in order to shut it down and return Hulse's mind back to normal. And she's gonna be she's gonna be really mad. Inside Hollis's mind, you'll see bigger, tougher sensors that have turned into bouncers inside the casino, and also a new enemy called a Bad Idea. Bad ideas uh, spawn actual nasty-looking light bulbs over their head that become dangerously explosive and blow up in Raz's face. Now, headquarters. One of the things that happens in Psychonauts 2 that's most exciting to Raz is that he gets to visit the headquarters of the Psychonauts themselves, which is called the Mother Lobe. This is the center for all Psychonauts activity, and Raz gets to see his old friends Sasha and Mia, who were counselors at summer camp in the first game. He now gets to see where they work. He gets to see their offices, he gets to see their labs, he gets to see their co-workers, other agents in the field, but also he gets to see the admin and maintenance staff as they go about their business and hang out in the cafeteria, and sort of the everyday happenings of uh, what life, what appears to be normal in the Psychonauts world. There are a lot of little hidden pathways and treasures around the base that he can find, side quests and scavenger hunts and things that you might recognize from the first game. There's a lot of characters to meet, a lot of fun things to discover, a lot of secrets about the Psychonauts themselves, and the lore of the founding of the Psychonauts, including the Psychic Six, who were seen on stumps around the campfire in the first game, but now we get to go much deeper into the story of how they played a part in the founding of the Psychonauts, um, how they were brought together and recruited by Ford Crawler and turned into this amazing international uh, espionage force. One of the things that was so important about the first game was exploring this natural environment around the summer camp, all the little hidden paths and caves where Raz's adventures took place. And so in the second game, we've expanded on that. There's an even bigger natural environment, multiple natural environments around the headquarters that you can explore. There's a quarry outside the mother lobe, which is where they dug out these massive deposits of titanium. Titanium, this psychoreactive mineral that amplifies and, and changes psychic powers. There's lots of secrets around the quarry, lots of abandoned mines and caves and things to explore and next door to the quarry is an abandoned roadside attraction called the questionable area a sort of power vortex of strange happenings which is also caused by the titanium deposits in the area water flows uphill animals behave strangely there's caves dedicated to the mystery of the sasclops which is a giant one-eyed being that might have existed and might not have. Here in the questionable area, Raz's family is camped out, his entire family, as if to embarrass him in front of his new Psychonauts friends. His family has showed up and they want him back in the circus. It turns out some of his family members, including his own father, have a little bit of psychic power themselves, and they'll be exploring that in Psychonauts 2. And you'll get to find out who put this curse on Raz's family to die in water? The Quados have been cursed by a mysterious character to all die in water, and this manifests itself in the uh, form of the Hand of Galokio, which is this hand that comes out of the water, which is really just Raz's psychic construct. Raz is so afraid of water because of the curse put on his family that every time he comes near water, this creepy hand comes out and tries to grab him and pull him under, which is all happening inside of Raz's head. In Second House 2, you'll get to find out who put this curse on Raz's family, where it came from, and what he can do about it. The story you uncover about the curse put on Raz's family links back into the story of the foundation of the Psychonauts, and Raz finds out that his family and the Psychonauts family are actually um, more intertwined than he believed. So there's a lot of mystery to discover for the player, and Raz, and his family, and his friends as they explore the connections between his family and the Psychonauts, and what it all has to do with Maligula. Maligula is a one of the first villains the Psychonauts ever fought. She's a powerful psychic and she's a mass murderer and she's been believed to be dead for many years. But there's a lot of unknown things going on behind the scenes and a lot of mysteries and a lot of uh, plots for the player to uncover in Psychonauts 2. So that's it. Thanks for taking this deeper look into Psychonauts 2 with me. The game is coming out August 25th and you can pre-order now. So I'll stop talking so you can go and do that. Thanks for watching. Hello? Nessa! Liu! Help! Lance! Dion! Thanks. No problem. Stick together and let's do this. Is this a disco?
This I do not like. I can use some help! Hit your pulse! This is not good. Not good. What if we open the doors and run? Just run. No stopping, no shooting, just straight to the bridge. Get that flasher! Heavy. Really? We call them tanks. I call them brutes. From Latin, brutus. We'd sound smart calling them brutes. Gion, you don't want to get in here and help name these? No, I'm good. Brute! <laughs> The Anna Cruces is looking like a game I didn't realize I needed in my life. And here from Stray Bombay to tell us more about the Anna Cruces is Chet Felisek. Chet, thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Now, talk to me about this game, the Anna Cruces. What's the concept? How, how did you come up with this? So I grew up with late 60s, early 70s sci-fi. I love that stuff, right? Logan's Run. Yes. Uh, you know, Battlestar Galactica Space 1999. That wasn't cheesy to me or campy. That was just the way sci-fi yeah. was. And so we wanted to set a game in that world, right? We have those cool colors, cool shapes, fantastical sci-fi weapons and creatures. And then it also lends itself to, we wanted something that was positive about the players, the characters, you're working together. Sure, there's aliens. Sure, you're fighting them. Sure, you're trying to save Earth. But you're doing it in a positive, uplifting way. Yeah, I just, after the pandemic, I don't think I could go back to a dreary post apocalyptic right. world. I need something uplifting. And so we wanted yeah. to deliver that. that. That's awesome. Now, talk to me about the gameplay. You, you've said that there's an infinite replayability to this. So, so how does that factor in? Yeah, so there's four player co ops. You're playing with your friends. And what we all want to do is make sure that it's different every time you're playing it. And so we have a lot of different systems that do that. But underneath it all is the idea of the AI driver. The AI driver is driving. Everything that's happening in the game with items, where they're placed, what's happening with the creatures, what's happening with your health kits, your perks, all of those systems are driven off of that. And so what that means is, as you're playing, not only do you have those, hey, this last time we played this, there was nothing here, and this time we're being overwhelmed. Yeah. And then you also have those peaks and valleys so that you have some downtime and then you have some really big uptime in it, or you know, a lot of combat happening in it. We're also monitoring how the people are playing. So if you're first time playing and your team isn't doing very well, we'll put health kits right on the main path for you to find. And then if you don't find them at first, we'll, we'll spawn a couple more later. But if you're really good, if you're really killing it, well, we might not put anything on the main path. And so if you wanna go find your perks or if you wanna go find new weapons, you have to go off that main path and go search for that. And it makes the game just a little bit harder, but in a way more interesting way than just saying, hey, let's double the health of all the enemies. Right. right. And then we do something of, we actually look from session to session as well. So if you play with the same three friends every week, and you guys have been killing it for 10 weeks in a row, well, let's mix it up for you. Let's just throw something crazy at you that you've never seen before, and a million aliens. And we can do that because you know, normally when you do difficulty, you've got to be here because you don't know what happened before or after. But here, we have these really big peaks and valleys, so we can bring you to nothing for a little bit and then have you have it go crazy. I love that it's it's scaling to to your basically your your skill level, right? Exactly. So, so that, yeah, that's fantastic. Now, kind of deeper dive more into the perk system that you're going to have in the game. So for the perks, we looked at a lot of games where you start with. Um, let's say a class-based thing. And then, you know, if you're playing with your same friends, well, I'm gonna be support, you're gonna be carry, someone else is gonna be help. Like, we, we kind of get into a rut of what systems we're playing and how we're playing. And so we wanna be able to mix that up so that every time you're playing, you're also kind of choosing your role based on the perks you're getting. So perks come in this thing called the Mata Compiler. And you have to go find the Mata Compilers in the world. And once you find one, you'll have from one to three perks to choose from. And then over time, you're essentially building a deck for your, for your character. And so you might have it where, if you saw in the trailer, there's a pulse, which is kind of like a, a melee shove. Well, you can invest into that, and you can have one that you can now recharge your pulse faster, and now it protects your, uh, other players around you. And then it gets more powerful, and you can actually do damage with it. So all of a sudden, you went from being a support character playing in the back to leading the charge going forward and knocking yeah. down aliens and everyone else blasting them. Or you'll get a bunch of perks that are about um, investing in one weapon and making it where you do headshots that actually does damage to other aliens around. So now you're the sniper hanging back. And so it's really mixing up that kind of experience that you're having. And you'll earn these perks as you play. So the more you play, the more perks you have. But since we want the game to always be great to play with your friends, if you've, if you've been playing, you know, I'll say you play with me. I've been playing 400 hours. You're brand new. Yeah. Well, we share the perks. 
so you get all the perks that I have available to me as well, so that way you yeah. get to have that experience of all that craziness right. in your game as well. Because it's all about having fun with your friends. Right, the shared experience with your friends. Now, we kind of already talked about the inspirations, like, like 2000, I looked at that and it was like 2001 Space Odyssey was the first thing I thought of, but let's talk more about the enemies in the game. What, what, what were some of the inspirations for that? So the enemies um, is, we kind of really look at it of how we want the players to behave as well as feel. And so we bring in outside playtesters every week. They play our game, we watch them, and what we'd see is really good teams would stick together really tightly. And even if we send something like the Brood at them that spreads them apart, they'd quickly form back together. So we created something called the Spawner. Yeah. And this is a good example of kind of how we approach the design. The Spawner, you hear off in the distance, and you'll hear it, and you know what it's doing. It's spawning things. It yeah. spawns these little turrets that come at you. They're not the worst thing, but they're gonna be unrelenting until you kill the Spawner. And so you'll be sticking with your team and you'll be like, oh, wait a minute, if the spawner comes now and this turrets come and we've got a guy down, we've got to go over there, I'm not sticking with my team. I'm gonna go hunt that thing down. I'm gonna go, go kill it. So you go run off, you kill it, you're feeling good about it. And all of a sudden you realize, wait, where are my teammates? I'm all alone. There's other specials here. Oh, I'm in trouble. And it's trying to create those kind of moments where it's mixing it up, where you always want to have it where it kind of almost takes turns of one player's the last one surviving, they're the last one up and they're helping everybody else up and get it going. And so really looking at having those enemies give you those moments for how it affects the players. Bonus question for you. What does the anacrusis actually mean? So anacrusis is a musical term. It means the, the notes before the song, the little, the little kind of intro. And for this, we have a character, Boris, that you never meet. Mm -hmm. um, and then all the parallels just talk about it, because I thought it was fun to have this character that you never really are sure who they are because it's everyone else describing it. And she, um, name the barge that you're on, that you're launching these missions, the Anacrusis. And her thought there was, this is not the main event. This is not us against the aliens with fighter pilots and everything else. This is just regular people. This is the pre-battle to the battle. This is finding out about these aliens and what just happened. Oh, that, that sounds so cool. Again, the Anacrusis, the, everything that you talked about today, it sounds amazing. I can't wait to get my hands on it. But Chet, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. We've got so much more coming in today's show, including Obsidian Entertainment with Grounded, I Illusions and Let It Roll with Shredders, and 343 Industries with a deeper dive on that incredible multiplayer trailer for Halo Infinite. But first, the original Stalker was one of the most intense and eerie games of its era. Next year, we return to Chernobyl for Stalker 2. And Zach from GSC Game World has a closer look at the game. Let's check it out. Hi everyone, it's Zach from GSC Game World. It has been several days since the gameplay reveal of Stalker 2. Our game now has a subtitle Heart of Chernobyl and a release date of April 28, 2022. By the way, the pre-orders are opened for both PC and Xbox. You're obviously here willing to learn more, so here are several details about Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl you probably didn't know yet. So let's dive a little bit deeper in our trailer. This section of the trailer is a bandit's gunfight on the chemical plant. You can see the actual in-game animations of picking up the weapons and installing modifications on the go. The thing is, you can notice the teaser of a new faction. We are not showing the exact moment right now, because we wonder if you can discover it yourself. You may actually recognize the exact location on the swamps. If you played Stalker Clear Sky, you may remember this place. The time did the job, but the tower is definitely still there. Also in this scene, you can see a brand new detector Skiff is using for the artifact hunt. Because of its form, it's called Gilka, which actually means a branch in the Ukrainian. The artifact Skiff is going to collect is called Jelly. In-game, it recovers your stamina. Moving to the Dancing Man scene. Before you ask it, yes, there will be a lot of characters with an interesting fate in the zone. His hideout is located in Chernobyl too. That's a town not so far from Pripet you have seen in the gameplay teaser. Это культура. А ты одно и то же по кругу лобаешь. 
<sighs> the campfires. A small isle of safety in the unwelcoming zone. A place where you can finally have a little rest before another foray. You have seen the campfire during the first trailer in the Ruki village. Of course, it wasn't the only one. The zone is full of dangers and mutants. The monsters are the result of the numerous experiments. We're not ready to show you all of them, so let's stick to the old good bloodsucker for now. In this rooftop scene, we are truly proud with the quality of the animations. We made a small behind-the-scenes video from our motion capture studio. The face photogrammetry process makes the final result as close to the reality as possible. The Gauss gun you're seeing in this section is one of the most powerful weapons from the arsenal. Moving to the final thing for today, the man at the end of the trailer is Sergei Grigorovich, the creator of the Stalker series. Thanks for joining us today. We can't wait for the moment when the time comes to enter the zone on April 28, 2022. As you just saw, Stalker 2 is shaping up to be something special, and I can't wait to play it next year when it comes to Xbox, PC, and Game Pass on day one. On Sunday, we saw the trailer for A Plague Tale Requiem, the sequel to the award-winning A Plague Tale Innocence. And for those of you who are fans of the original, we've got some good news for you too. Where is he? The King is back, and here to tell us more about Age of Empires 4 are Adam Icegreen and Emma Bridal from World's Edge. Thank you both for being Hi. here. Thanks, Thanks for having us on, Paris. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> my, my legacy age player, I'm excited for this. Now, you had some news at the briefing. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk about that a little more? Well, I mean, fans got to have their first looks at two more of our launch civilizations, um, the Abbasid dynasty and the French. Yes. Um, and they bring a lot to the table, um, totally different ways to play. But I'm uh, really excited to show them those. And then also, people got to see their first taste of naval gameplay, uh, which we haven't shown off at all, except for a little teaser at the end of Fan Preview. Paying off that tease. And exactly. we also revealed one more of our campaigns, the Hundred Years' War, and uh, Joan of Arc made an appearance. Uh, we also announced that the game is coming October 28th, and it's coming to Windows Store, Steam, and, of course, Game Pass for PC. Now, earlier you mentioned the two civilizations, the Abbasid dynasty and the French. Can you kind of go into detail about that? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, I guess I'll start. Um, the Abbasid. So the Abbasid dynasty is this amazing technological powerhouse of a civilization that um, has a really unique mechanic that we're bringing to uh, them in Age of Empires IV. It's actually unique uh, across all the civs that are in the game in that they, they construct this bastion of knowledge called the House of Wisdom, and they can keep upgrading it with different wings, and that gives them a host of incredible technologies that leverage their army, their economy, their resources. Um, but beyond even that, they have an incredible amount of fun units, uh, especially camels, uh, unique to the civs again. Uh, the launch civs for Age of Empires IV is camel units. And these camels have amazing uh, abilities to buff the other units in their armies. And so you have these wonderful diverse mixes where you always want to be throwing different units together, but always including camels for the different kinds of buffs and advantages you can give uh, to, your, to your civilization. It's great. And the French are really, really strong with trade. They've got some great options that are going to make your late game really, really mm -hmm. interesting. They have a landmark called the House of Commerce. And for your units, you're going to really want to focus on knights and lances. Those are your powerhouses. But the French actually made an ap appearance in the trailer uh, as part of the Hundred Years' War campaign. And uh, as you can see, Joan there, I'm actually wearing her around my neck. She's a feminist icon from history. This young woman who led with her convictions and led a battle, and she was a teenager. And so she's beloved. She's She's in age two in a campaign, and so we know age fans are going to love seeing her again. And the Hundred Years' War with the multiple missions, like the Battle of the Thirty, are really going to bring that period of history to life. And all the live action footage that you saw in the trailer on Sunday, that's all from within the game. Wow. We have these multiple documentaries that will play between the missions to storytell and really bring it to life as you journey through the Hundred Years' War. Yeah, taking a completely different approach to how we're uh, telling a story mm -hmm. in Matter of fact, I don't think I've seen any game that no. does what we're doing yeah. in terms of wow. how we're showing the story and how we're getting people involved yeah. with history. So it really, super exciting. really brings it to life. And, and I've learned things about English history from these documentaries I didn't learn in school. So yeah. they're educating as, as well as moving the game forward. Now, community feedback is always important in, in any game, but especially in something like Age. Now, how have you taken some of that feedback into development for Age 4? So we formed a community council back in 2017. We wanted our community and our players to have a seat at the table for development. We're making the game for them. So they've been hands-on with the game for a really long time and giving us their honest feedback. And we then take that to the game team and they look at making changes based on what they've told us. So they've influenced things from the look of the UI icons, the influence system that's built into age four. They have really, really helped us with their viewpoints make the game better. Uh, and one thing they really pushed for actually was naval. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, we actually, you know, if you look at a lot of the data, you know, we see data on all of the Age of Empires games that people play, and naval is one of those things that in Age 2, a lot of people don't use it, which is crazy, right? But if it wasn't there, people would miss it so much. And, and sometimes we have to ask those hard questions when we're making games, right? We say, like, do we, do we need to do this? And it was something that we, we felt weird about. And we went to the council with it, and we're like, hey, you know, not even you guys don't play naval all the time. Like, do we need it? And they're like, yeah, no, we see your point, but you know, you have to have this. Yeah. And it was great. It was a great reaffirmation. Um, and we throw a lot of things like that at our council to make sure that we're making the game that's great for all the different kinds of players that love Age of Empires all over the world. And now we're heading towards launch. Yeah. We're branching out beyond our council. People are going to get hands on for the first time. So we had a fan preview event back in April, and we looked at the feedback from that and have made changes since then. So, yeah. you know, you let us know that you didn't feel like the weapon scaling was quite right. So mm -hmm. we've gone ahead and we've improved that. That is fantastic. Now, you actually hit on something that I wanted to jump into mm -hmm. because Age has been around for a while. There's <laughs> been previous games, but you continue to make content for those. So mm -hmm. what's some of the news you can share as far as development with some of the legacy Age games? Uh, well, we have a new expansion coming in August for Age 2 Definitive Edition called Dawn of the Dukes. And in that expansion, we're going to be adding two more civilizations, the Bohemians and the Poles, and three new campaigns for the Lithuanians, the Bohemians, and the Poles. And those are great Great stories about uh, really cool, like, uh, brother, brother, brother and sister teams that work together to kind of rise up these empires. And I can't wait for people to get a ha their hands on it. And the great thing is, is that if you pre-order Age of Empires 4, um, you get that for free. That's part of the deal for pre-ordering Age 4 on, on the different platforms. And um, for Age 3, of course, because we don't want to leave them out either. No. Um, H3 <laughs> Definitive Edition, we're hard at work on an African PDLC with new civilizations and campaigns. Cool. Yeah. And I can't wait to, uh, to show more, but we're not ready to, to talk about that one just yet. But if you don't want to miss out, go to ageofempires.com, become an insider. You get little sneak peeks at things we've got coming and chances to get hands-on with content early. Yeah. Now, shifting us back to the present in H4, mm -hmm. 
What's some of the things people can expect as we, we lead up to launch? Well, we've got a bit of an exclusive for you today. I so like we, <laughs> yeah, we're going to name our remaining launch sieves and our remaining launch campaigns. We're not going to show them just yet. That'll come closer to launch. Mm -hmm. But our two remaining civilizations are the Holy Roman Empire and the Rus. And uh, the names of our two remaining campaigns are the Rise of Moscow and the Mongol Empire. All that sounds yeah. fantastic. Please. Oh no, no, I was just going to say I'm so excited. I get all gushing <laughs> about things like this. Um, we're gonna, you're gonna have to wait a little more to, to get information and see more detail on those civilizations and campaigns, but um, we've also got you know, a ton of stuff planned. We have a beta that's gonna be coming up. Mm -hmm. So um, you, know, you can go to ageofempires.com yep. to sign up for be an insider to get in our beta and get a chance to actually get hands-on with the game. Mm -hmm. And then of course, again, you know, we're launching October, October 28th. 28th. Yeah. Yep. How long to wait? Uh, on, uh, you know, on Steam, on Windows 10, and on Game Pass for PC. Mm -hmm. So it should be great any way you want to play. We're just uh, really excited. That, that, <laughs> that is great. And I'm sure Age fans all around the world are really looking forward to that. So again, Adam, Emma, thank you so much for thank being here. Thanks for having us on. Here. No, thank you. Massive battles across land, air, and sea have been a hallmark of the Battlefield series from the beginning. In this next video, Design director Daniel Berlin will tell us more about what DICE can do when it brings all-out warfare to the world's most powerful console. Incoming fire! Attention all squads. The thing that will really excite players is the introduction of all this cutting-edge technology that we're just infusing into the sandbox. I think just having the comeback of the helicopter on the battlefield, it just introduces a whole new layer to the sandbox. It just gives players so much more tools that makes it more battlefield than it's been in a very long time. So we really enable our players to be really, really creative with the tools we give them. And that's what Battlefield is, is, is kind of all about, being in a massive, open, war setting and being able to say like, hey, there's a problem over there, go solve it. And the players actually choose how they want to solve that problem and through that process create their own battlefield moments. So in 2042, you will experience three really distinct experiences. Um, the one we're talking about right now, we're talking about today, is the experience that we call the all-out warfare experience. Now, this is the place you go in 2042 when you want to have those classic battlefield experiences, this massive war where it's, you know, air, land, and sea, you're just coming together in these massive battles. But we've actually made a distinction between two separate experiences within the all-out warfare uh, experience, and that's Conquest, which is a very much a staple for our franchise. It's something that our fans know and love and we're just taking the Conquest experience to the max this time around. Conquest is all about um, the freedom, the access to the sandbox, being able to choose where you fight, how you fight, where you want to go. But it's also experience that um, will allow players to kind of choose their own pacing. And there's moments in Conquest where it's complete chaos. When a lot of players, just, just, they just converge on a single point and the chaos goes up to the maximum. But there's also moments within Conquest where, you know, you've just had that big battle and now you've won that battle and you go like, okay, you bring up your map and you have a conversation with your friends and you say like, okay, where do we want to go next? Oh, we need to go over there to that state. Okay, how do we get there? Oh, let's call in a vehicle. And a vehicle, you can uh, call it in wherever you want. And then your friends, you hop into the transport vehicle and you go across the map and you go to a new location where there's a new fight. So Conquest is just that full freedom to the sandbox. And right next to that lives um, the other experience within All Out Warfare, which is Breakthrough. And this is a significantly more guided experience. It takes you um, on a journey throughout the entire map. And in Breakthrough, there's an attacker and there's an, a defender team. Um, and we kind of compress them into fighting head on in a specific space. So the, the, the time to action is short and the level of chaos is really, really high. There's helicopters and there's tanks and there's infantry. There's just everything happening and it's just complete chaos and breakthrough. So All That Warfare kind of takes these two fan favorite staple modes and we, we make them distinctly lean into their specific strength. And that's on the Xbox Series X and the Xbox Series S, you will actually be able to play 
uh, all our warfare experiences up to 128 players, which is a double to what we've done in the past in the franchise. And this is really, you know, you can have those moments when you're playing 2042, when you're sitting in the helicopter and you look down and you just see this, you know, sea of tanks, soldiers, infantry, helicopters, fighter jets just moving in unison. And you kind of get this feeling that you're part of something bigger, like a really, really massive army. And that's the strength of the massive play spaces that we're building. And we're able to really make this play really well. We've altered our way of handling level design. Uh, because it wasn't just as simple as, um, you know, just making it bigger and then portion the, the locations out. It doesn't really work that way. So we've leaned into a new type of design mentality that we're calling clustering. Now, what clustering means that you will have a massive battlefield in front of you. But within this massive battlefield, you will have particular clusters of objectives. So the map Hourglass is set in Doha, Qatar, and it is... Um, I'm not going to go into any specifics about exactly how large it is, um, but it is definitely one of the larger uh, maps that we will have in 2042. It's one of my favorite maps personally because it has some really, really cool distinct locations within it. Down to the south of the map you'll have a uh, fully destructible uh, village. This is a great space for infantry and vehicles alike because you know as a battlefield player that infantry is skulking around inside the buildings but you know when you're in your tank or your attack helicopter you can just you know can destroy those buildings and get access to the infantry and you can go further east and you'll find a bunch of high rises skyscrapers and so there's a whole section there where you can enter the skyscrapers you can go up to the top of them you can zip line between the roofs have fights in between the rooftops but if you want to change it up even more, you can basically skydive off of the skyscrapers. And if you're playing a particular specialist that has access to a wingsuit, you can actually glide across the entire map space and get yourself all the way over to the stadium, which is on the east side of the map. And uh, the stadium itself, it's a place you go when you really want to just take out your shotgun and have some close quarters combat. No! So the mentality here of building larger maps but creating locations within that map where there's a particular type of gameplay. And with the Conquest game mode, for example, you will also see the, the fact that if you want to capture the entirety of the stadium, it's not just to go there and capture one location. You actually have to capture multiple locations within the stadium in order for you to kind of to, to consider it yours, that your team can actually get benefits from it. So um, lots of dynamic moments on Hourglass. And if you saw in the gameplay trailer as well, there's a massive wall of sand moving across the entire gameplay space. So what happens when this massive wall comes, of course it engulfs you in the storm itself. But as it passes by, it leaves the, the entirety of the map in a different mood, in a different light, and it changes the visibility for the player. And this is a really good time for you to lean into our plus system where you have the capability to actually alter the customization on your weapon. I'd also like to mention though that the wall of sand is one thing, right? But there's also the possibility of the tornado. The tornado is this massive disruptor that just comes into the play space and it, wherever it goes, destruction follows. It's a massive uh, moving physical entity that will pick you up, throw you across the map, pull helicopters into it. Um, it's just a crazy, fun physics experience that happens as you play the map. So everything is in the hands of the player. This really is a sandbox and these moments are in the hands of the player. While in other games, the battlefield moments are pre-scripted, in our game, it, they just happen, and they happen differently every single time because it's players controlling what's happening around you. That's something that you only get in Battlefield, and that's, that's why I love Battlefield so much. Epic action at an epic scale is what we all want from Battlefield 2042, and DICE looks poised to deliver. During the showcase on Sunday, we announced an exciting collaboration between Rare, Xbox, and Disney with Sea of Thieves, A Pirate's Life, a free update which brings Captain Jack Sparrow and his crew sailing into the Sea of Thieves. Today, we're premiering a brand new trailer showing some of the gameplay you'll experience when you team up with Jack Sparrow 
for this all new adventure. I can't wait to be a part of this crew. Let's take a look. You will always remember this is the day your crew was joined by Captain Jack Sparrow. To the Sea of Thieves, quick as you like, chop chop. It's time to bridge the worlds and take our rightful places as Lords of the Sea. Now we have awoken, and we are hungry. Perhaps they'll take me on the grand tour of me, Fallen Kingdom. I was starting to think you'd taken a tumble. Not everyone's as steady on their feet as I am. This is the first place I've found where everyone appreciates my unique uniqueness. They're coming aboard! Keep your crusty claws off me! Davy Jones wishes you destroyed, and I shall oblige him. What is that infernal noise? It's Captain Infernal Noise to you, mate! Spara! Destroy that statue, and there'll be the double to pay! Enough of this! Hear me, my daughter! Come more than me! Whatever they've told you, it's not true. Unless it's flattering, in which case, it's all true, but they left out the best bits. Sammy? Hey everyone, Joni, executive producer on Sea of Thieves here. So we've shown you the cinematic trailer, we've shown the gameplay trailer, but there's still more to come. So on Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. UK and 8 p.m. in Europe, we have the Sea of Thieves A Pirate's Life Showcase. So this is a real deep dive just into all of the details behind this collaboration with Disney. How did we bring Jack Sparrow into our world? How did we capture his humor and his charm and all of the kind of characters that are coming in as a part of this? You're gonna get a first look at a couple of tales and actual gameplay of those. We're gonna get some behind the scenes interviews with our development team and also just to chat with us with Disney just about how this collaboration came to be. So it's going to be amazing. I hope everybody tunes in. So we'll see you on Sunday. I'm ready for the danger zone. But we'll get to that in just a second. 
When Microsoft Flight Simulator launched last year on PC, reviewers and gamers alike were blown away by the stunning visuals and the depth of simulation. Joining us is Jorg Newman, the head of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Jorg, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Good to meet you. Those are cool glasses. <laughs> you get your jacket. Yeah, I got my jacket <laughs> as well. So you had some announcements this Sunday about Microsoft Flight Simulator. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, it was super cool. We announced yeah. that Microsoft Flight Simulator is coming to uh, Xbox Series X and S. And the franchise has an awesome history on the PC. It's going back all the way to 1982. You know, it predates Office and Windows. And uh, when we launched last year, it was on the PC only. And it was a really warm welcome from simmers and from press and from people who have never flown flights in before. Yeah. So we we're super excited that it comes to console now. And um, so for the first time in the history of the franchise. So I've been playing Flight Simulator since last year on PC. I have a 3080, but it is now coming to the Xbox Series X. X and S, what sorcery are you doing to get this running on both of those consoles? I have to know. I think it's a combination of two things, really. I mean, first off, it's a super powerful console. Yes. And then we are really using the Microsoft tech stack in an interesting way. So as you know, Series X and S is like a beast. The, 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 the GPU is awesome, super powerful CPU with multiple cores, uh, RAM, fast RAM, uh, we can run in 4K. That's super important for planes. Because yeah. you sit there in the cockpit, you need to be able to read all the text. SSD, fast yeah. internet. So it's basically the equivalent of a really powerful high-end PC. And on top of that, on Flight Sim, we're using the Microsoft stack a lot. Like we have 2.5 petabyte of data. It's 1.6 million CDs yeah. uh, sitting on Azure. And um, we're basically streaming that down as you go. And uh, we also do machine learning algorithms up there, and that is how we build procedurally, in runtime, 1.5 billion houses and 2 trillion trees. So it's a combination of those two things. Super powerful console, super good use of the Microsoft tech stack. You get it to work on console. That is fantastic. Now, with Xbox Game Pass and with it coming to console, you're going to expose Flight Simulator to a, whole, a lot of new gamers, right? So what are some of the things that you're going to do to make it more accessible to a wider audience. So we had, to, you're exactly right. We had a little bit of that last year when mm -hmm. we launched because we knew the flight simmers, that's their hobby, they came in, they know everything about aviation, they know exactly what to do. But we had a lot of people come in through Xbox Game Pass on PC and basically tried for the first time. So we. Even on the PC launch, we did a bunch of work on onboarding with tutorials. We gave some assistances. But now for this Xbox version, we're actually doing a ton more. Mm -hmm. And I actually brought you a little video. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's five things we did. The first thing, if you're becoming a pilot, the first thing you do is you do a discovery flight. It's basically, you know, you have, your, you have a flight instructor next to you. He does most of the work, he or she. And you get to steer the plane and feel really yeah. good about yourself, yeah. right? And, and so we said, we need to recreate that. So we picked two, two pl 10 places on Earth, like some of the most compelling places, like Mount Everest or Rio de Janeiro or New York or the pyramids. And we basically put you in a plane. It's ready to go. It's beautiful weather. Yeah. And all you need to do is fly and have fun. And it's, it's, it really is an onboarding experience. It's super good. And then we noticed on the PC side that people are really love to explore the world in flight sim. I did that. I've, I've spent like a month in South America, and I've never been to South America. Yeah. And it was super cool. Um, but it was only visuals. And um, you know, so you didn't quite understand how everything fits together. So now yeah. we added labels, and Bing has all these labels basically for every for every POI like famous place or river or mountain. So we have all those now, and we put that into the world map. And even if you go down and you try to plan out your flight, you can now see all the cities around you, and it totally transforms the experience. Same in in game. So we now have labels in game where you see. You know, here's Everett. Over there is, you know, what, whatever. The, and you learn about the, the planet more. And it's, it's a much more enriching experience just, just experiencing the planet. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The next thing we did um, is that we re-ramped we re the tutorials. We wanted to basically smoothen out the, the, the onboarding experience. We wanted to retain knowledge more. So we had eight tutorials on the PC. Now we have 22. Oh, wow. And it's, they're shorter, they're much more focused, and we have a performance, um, a performance indicator system. So basically, it rates you and how you did, and you get a score. And honestly, I can speak for myself. Like, I'm totally motivated to get better and better and better. And with that, you learn more and more how, do you, re how you really fly. So it's been super successful, and I think it's going to help newcomers a lot. The next feature that we have is it's called Flight Assistant, which I use a lot. Um, <laughs> it's basically, so just imagine you fly over New York, and you see 
you, you want to actually just look at the landscape, but, and look at the city, but you, you know eventually you want to go to Brooklyn Bridge. So on the flight instructor, you can now, uh, flight assistance, you can now click on, go to Brooklyn Bridge, and the AI, almost like a co-pilot next to you, will fly you to the Brooklyn Bridge, and you can just look around and have an interesting time. Same with airports, which are sometimes challenging for people. Like, you can click on the airport and say, please land me at, say, Newark Airport. And then the last thing is, if you really get yourself in trouble, like you stall out the plane or something like that, you can actually now click into, <laughs> uh, you can now go and, and basically say, recover. And it's almost like the pilot is sitting next to you. It's super helpful. I think that people will love it. And the last thing was, um, you know, we learned that people are, everybody is good taking off, but some people are hesitant to land, specifically yes. when you look at like big international airports and they seem scary and you need to talk to the air traffic controller and all that, super technical. So we added a new feature called Land Anywhere. Just land, let them land anywhere. And then um, when you do that, the first thing you see is 71% of the planet is water. Yes. So we added basically floats to a bunch of our planes and you can land all, everywhere now in the ocean or in rivers or wherever. Same with snow. So we have skis on, ski, on, on our planes now, and so you can go to the polar regions, mountaintops, or when it's winter, because we have winter and it's snowing, uh, you can now land anywhere. So I think those five things in combination will really make it easier for people who have never been in a flight sim, because it's, you know, we, 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 as we made a decision not to dumb down the flight sim. It's not easier, it's not gamified. Right. Like we, made, we, gave you assist, we gave assistances to help you learn how to actually play, fly a plane. And I think we're gonna achieve that. So, one thing on PC is there's a ton of flight accessories that you can use as far as various peripherals and controls. What are you going to be able to bring to the console that can somewhat replicate that experience? Totally. Uh, so a good news story. Uh, so there's two really good flight sticks already on the console. It's the Thrustmaster T-Flight Hotas 1, if you have that. And then there's also the Hoti Hotas flight stick. Yep. And so we fully support those two. And then we worked with all the main top-notch peripheral makers, both on PC and Xbox. And I can, all I can say is there are going to be some really good announcements coming up. Yeah. And for Core Simmer, I can say, you can now play. We have the software to, to have a full Core Sim experience, and we'll have the hardware on Xbox, all for the first time on a console. It's going to be great. Oh, that's going to be great. Now, we, we obviously had the funny start with, with the Top Gun Maverick expansion pack. You announced that. But can you go into a little more detail about that? So yeah, I mean... Can expect? We couldn't be more excited, right? Like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really like a dream come yeah. true. If you think about entertainment and the franchises that celebrate aviation, you will actually come to Microsoft Flight Simulator and, and Top Gun, and the, the, it's a yeah. perfect marriage. So um, I can't say that much about it, because the movie obviously is, you know, keeps everything under wraps. Yeah. But if you, watch, if you watch the trailer carefully, you saw there's some F-18s, and there's an aircraft carrier. There might be another plane. And then I can say is we're going to go fast, like really fast, yeah. and we're going to be in the danger zone with that this is, one. That is going to be great. Really looking forward to that. Now, as we wrap this up, there's not much else you can say about the Maverick expansion pack, but what else can people expect from Flight Simulator in the near future? A lot. So um, ever since launch, we said we're going to launch. We're going to launch and have a new update, like a big, meaningful update every single month. And we launched nine months ago, and we had nine updates. Uh, so we have something that's called world updates, where we just pick a zone on Earth, like the United States or Japan or like England and Ireland, and we make that really better. Like we get the latest, the best possible satellite imagery. We, we create an elevation map that basically makes the mountains look better. We, we, make, we create 3D cities. Like after launch, we launched London and Paris. And, and we also make missions. So we celebrate the planet like with these updates. And we're just going to go around the planet. We're, we're, we're shipping two more this year and six more next year. And then we also have something called sim updates, simulation updates, where we work with the manufacturers of planes, with the flight sim community out there that knows tons about everything, <laughs> and, uh, and also with, uh, with, with real world pilots. And we're, we're basically making the sim better and better. The goal is to make the ultimate sim. Yeah. It's the perfect thing of totally authentic. And then on top of that, you should expect the unexpected. Like with, just like with Maverick, which I don't think people really got, saw coming, yeah. there will be more of that. And I think I, all I can say is it'll get the gamers and the simmers both their hearts pounding. So keep watching the skies. That is awesome. Now, again, I'm so excited that more people are going to get to play Flight Simulator. I've been playing it on PC. I love it. I highly recommend everyone do the flight from LA to Paris. It's really good, very cathartic. But <laughs> as we get out of here, I want to thank you so much for taking some time to talk about Flight Simulator. Can't wait for the expansion pack. Thank you so much. It right, was thank awesome. You. Thank you. Still to come, we have Grounded, Shredders, 
and of course, Halo Infinite. But first, one of the best PC games of 2020 was Hades, and it's got a ton of awards to prove it. Here's a closer look at what we can expect from Supergiant Games later this year on Xbox Series X and S. We just announced that Hades, our Game of the Year winning roguelike dungeon crawler, is coming soon to Xbox, and I want to introduce you to some of the gods, ghosts, and monsters you'll meet in our rendition of the ancient Greek underworld. You don't need any prior interest in Greek myth to get into Hades, but as you play, maybe you'll get to wondering how much of this stuff comes from mythology. The answer is, a whole lot. Greek myth is filled with wild, fascinating, often contradictory stories of these larger-than-life characters. The Olympians are a big, complicated family, always bickering and always pushing each other, and their portrayals in classical mythology inspired our portrayals in Hades. Let's start with Hades himself. What is it now? Of a mountain of infernal parchment work. He's often relegated to the role of villain in many modern adaptations of Greek myth, but in classical mythology, he's a complicated guy, and much more principled than some of his brothers or sisters. He's so fascinating, we made a whole game about him. As the god of the dead, Hades has an imposing reputation to live up to, so he even has a monstrous pet in the three-headed hound of hell, Cerberus. The idea that this savage beast was still somebody's pet dog crystallized how we wanted to portray the gods in Hades, that despite being immortal and all-powerful, they're not so different from the rest of us. Though, let's not forget Zagreus. We've heard from many players who figured Zagreus was a god of our own creation. After all, who's ever heard of Hades having any kids? But according to some ancient sources, he did. Greetings, father. My ransacking was a delight, thank you for asking. So I'll just be on my way again. In classical mythology, Zagreus is a little-known Chthonic god, meaning a god of the underworld, sometimes associated with Dionysus, the god of wine. But in other cases, he is associated with Hades. How could Hades have a son nobody knows about? How does he fit into the myths we do know of Hades? We were so drawn to answering these questions that they form the basis for the entire story of this game. If you're the prince of the underworld, who do you get as your personal trainer? That would be Achilles, a near-invincible warrior in his day, once called the greatest of the Greeks. It's good to see you, lad. Despite the circumstances, remember your training out there. The pain of death is but another obstacle. Hades takes place after his untimely demise during the Trojan War, once he's had a lot of time to reflect on his life choices. Achilles lived in glory, so he's got an okay gig in the afterlife, but some wretched souls end up in a really bad spot in the underworld. And for better or worse, they get to meet Megara. Ever stubborn, aren't you? Maybe my whip might make you reconsider whatever it is that you're attempting here. She is one of the three Fury sisters tasked with torturing some of the absolute worst souls for all eternity. And in our game, she's also tasked with making sure Zagreus doesn't make it out of the underworld. These two have a lot of history, and since the story of Hades keeps moving forward each time you play, the more you run into Megara, the better you'll get to know her. There's also Thanatos. Death approaches. He may decide to drop in on you when he isn't busy whisking the souls of the recently departed to the underworld. Thought you could just get away from me, did you? He is the personification of death, according to Greek myth, though represents more of a peaceful death than, say, the kind that happened a lot during something like the Trojan War. So even though he can seem a little sinister at first, in the spirit of the mythology, we wanted our Thanatos to have a gentler side. Thanatos has a couple of brothers in Hades, such as Hypnos here, the personification of sleep. What? Paul says here one of the wretched thugs got you too bad. When he's not dozing on the job, Hypnos can comment on every single possible way you can die in this game, of the dozens and dozens of different possibilities. Where did all these gods of the underworld come from anyway? According to the Theogony, an ancient Greek creation myth by Hesiod that introduces all the gods and their ancestors, many of the Chthonic gods came from Nyx, the personification of night. Darkness guides you, child. You have outgrown this house. Of that I am now certain. Should you return again here, I shall keep you safe. She is a primordial goddess, meaning she is much older even than Hades or the Olympians. And in our game, she has an important role in the underworld, not the least of which is helping you unlock some of your hidden power. There are 30 different characters to meet and grow closer to the more you play Hades, and we hope you enjoy getting to know them all. Some of them feel truly ancient and godlike. Some are funny, some are scary. 
We found them incredibly inspiring and hope you do too, once you get to meet everybody when Hades comes to Xbox One and Series X on August 13th. to tell us more about the Grounded Update are Adam and Eric from Obsidian Entertainment. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a real honor. No, absolutely. Love Grounded, love everything that you guys have been doing with it. Now, my first question is this mushroom system. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, so that's one of the big things for the Shroom and Doom update is uh, mushrooms. We're really changing how the, the uh, yard is with mushrooms. Every mushroom that you see in the yard is now harvestable, which is really cool. So the small ones, the big ones, the big toadstools, the ones that you find in caves. Now, those were present in the yard before, but now you can actually harvest them um, and get mushroom uh, stuff out of them. Um, the next kind of uh, part of that is that uh, we're adding a couple base building elements uh, like mushroom bricks. Yeah. So you have to take all those mushrooms that you find and then you have to grind them up in a grinder, which is a new building. And then you have to take them to your oven, which is another new building that we're adding and uh, bake the, the mushroom uh, stuff into bricks. And then uh, with the mushroom brick buildings, there's a whole host of new options for base builders. Um, and it's more fortified walls um, and a bunch of other options. So you can build a cool big castle. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> now. We saw the brood mother, so you're bringing bosses into Grounded. What can you tell me about that? What does that mean for the direction of the game as we move forward? Yeah, so uh, the brood mother is our first boss. Yeah. Um, that, so we, we actually launched with the brood mother, um, and we didn't really feel it hit the right mark. So we took the brood mother out, and we wanted to spend a lot of time making it a really memorable boss fight. So we put a lot of development effort in, behind the brood mother, and it's going to really feel like a big, huge fight and a memorable one. Um, there's a lot of kind of 
cool things with it. I don't want to spoil everything. Yeah, right. I want players to kind of experience it for themselves. But uh, it definitely is uh, something that we want players' feedback uh, to see, like, what do they like? What do they not like? How is the challenge? We want to make it really challenging um, and have a good reward for defeating the Broodmother. But is it going to be, is it too hard? Uh, we'd like to know that. So uh, for future development on Grounded, like, we want to make more bosses. And so we want to get all that feedback to improve the system. Now, you actually bring up a great point about community, but I'll put a pin in that and come back to it in a <laughs> second. So I know you don't want to spoil anything about the brood mother, but is there any tips you can kind of give people ahead of time on what they can do to survive that encounter? I would definitely say that <laughs> you would need to make sure you have the highest tier armor and yeah. gear up really well for this fight because it, it is going to be difficult. And then uh, you also want to have the right mutations equipped as well. Uh, and uh, if you're playing with your friends, uh, it might be good to, for one of your friends or yourself to use the brand new crossbow we're going to put into the game so you can have some range DPS while someone else like face tanks the, the Broodmother. Yeah. So it's going to be pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So again, going back to community, I, I know you love getting feedback about Grounded, obviously starting as an early access game, but um, what are some of the things that you're looking for as far as in this, this update? Is What was something that you got feedback-wise from the community that you put in this update? Yeah, so there's, there's, you know, it's one thing that we love working with community. So that's, that's something that we, as developers, we love just hearing what people have to yeah. say about the game. And we're continually developing it with the community. Um, so there's a lot of new things in our, in our new update. Um, one of those things is uh, flipping buildings. Um, and that's one thing that we're really, like, uh, just adding, like, those little features. Uh, another one is just sprinting up ladders, which is something that, like, you know, just hearing people how they interact with ladders and adding a sprint mode. The other one is one of our uh, funnier features that we're adding is sitting in chairs. Yeah. <laughs> so it's something yeah. that, that yeah. a lot of people yeah. really, really wanted. Um, we're also interested in like the first phase of t pets in the game. So we're going to start with yeah. aphids. So you'll be able to tame an aphid, oh, run around cool. the yard with the aphid. But you also got to make sure you protect your aphid because yeah. accidents can happen in yeah. the backyard. Oh, there, there's one other thing too, achievements. So we're really excited to, to announce that we yeah, have finally. achievements in Grounded, and that's that's purely based on everyone's feedback. Everyone's been wanting achievements, yeah. and so we're finally adding them to the game. That's really good. Now, again, sticking with this uh, the, the topic of community, so this was an early access game, and it sounds like pretty much the foundation of what Grounded is was built off of community feedback. So how does that process work internally for you as far as people submitting like, hey, I, I, I want to sit, you know, I want achievement bets. <laughs> like, how does that whole process work? So we have a lot of, like, avenues where we gather feedback from the community. So we have, we do weekly developer streams where mm -hmm. chat can ask a bunch of questions with when we have Adam on or other developers or myself. Uh, and we'll get, gather feedback and sessions there. And then our main source of feedback is through our official Discord, uh, Grounded the Game. And uh, I use a series of bots to gather a bunch of feedbacks from the players and then from there, uh, me, Adam, uh, a couple members of the team, and from also from the community team get together, and we have a weekly meeting going over all the suggestions and kind of prioritizing what will work and what we can what we can put later in the future for like other suggestions. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking some time to come talk to me about this new update for Grounded. It looks like a lot of fun. I'm gonna get to sit, I guess. Right. Yep. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> thank you Thanks. so much. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's almost time for a closer look at the multiplayer trailer for Halo Infinite. But first, it's time to see what the snow, the slopes, and the powder spray look like when powered by Xbox Series X and S. This is Shredders. Hey there and welcome to the stream where you'll get an extra glimpse on our snowboard game that's called Shredders. I'm Dirk van Welden, project lead at Foam Punch. Hello, this is Marcus Poshmo, tech lead on Shredders and Foam Punch. Yeah, you've probably seen our trailer at the Xbox event. Uh, we've been tinkering on this game for a while now, and while it's still in development, we're happy to show you more of this game. So I'm switching to our developer drone cam. I can actually spawn wherever I want, like instantly. But I first want to show you some of the areas uh, we've been working on. Uh, this mountain resort is called Frozen Wood. It's inspired by some of the resorts in the French Alps where I've been snowboarding a lot. It has these cozy parks, side kickers, half pipes, really big rails, a lot of features in there. Way more than you would expect in a normal mountain resort. But hey, this is a video game and we want as many features as possible. 
So yeah, like I said, this is completely open and you can go snowboarding anywhere you'd like. You can do some missions, there's like a story evolving around the main character that wants to participate in a kick-ass invitational border cross event. But you can also just cruise around and find some nice lines with a good flow, like for example here in the Spillow-like environment that was shown in the trailer. Or you can go up there, like take some huge kickers and big rails at the big park. And just look how big this mountain range is, like we've got space for industrial areas and street areas, there's backcountry, high mountain riding, there's even an old Italian looking village you can shred. A lot of these locations have been inspired by events happening all over the world and snowboarding movies that inspired us these past years. It's kind of a tribute too, in fact. Also, anywhere you go, you can always ride during golden hour due to our real-time lighting engine. But hey, having a fun and realistic environment is nice, but it's not fun without nailing the riding itself, right? Yeah, so for the actual snowboarding, a big inspiration for us all, I think it's been pro riders, snowboard movies and all the crazy stuff that they do on a snowboard. And of course ourselves riding in real life and just having fun and being creative on a snowboard. It, that's something that we want to bring into the game. Conceptually, we're trying to keep the convention of one stick for the board and one stick for the body and directly map that onto the snowboarder. So at any point you should get a physical or animation response as soon as you're touching those sticks. And it, it gives you a lot of freedom in your playstyle. So you can choose to be smooth and lazy or if you are more like fast and aggressive or you can change up your style however you want. We want the motions kept fluid and stylish while still being very reactive. So th that's a big challenge and we had to create a complete animation system dedicated just for this. And here you can see the board interacting with the snow. He puts some weight into his turn and he really digs in those edges into the snow for a clean carve. Or you, you can just use the, the board stick here to speed check, to line up for a feature. But you can also use both of the sticks combined for even greater control. Yeah, like you, here you can see him balancing on the tail of the board. This is called buttering. And from this stance you can also start tricking just as in normal riding. So for the trick stiff system, we're trying to give as much control as possible to any trick you've seen in a movie or any crazy trick that you can imagine while still making it look great. Every grab you can do, you can also tweak it out with a board stick. So, so for a really big spin you have to get the timing down in the takeoff. And while you're in there, you keep your body tight, so you keep spinning at that high rate. And then it's just a matter of putting down your feet when it's time to land. When we succeed, it looks very simple and natural. So that is what we're trying to achieve, a really fun snowboard game. A new day is upon us. A new generation built to fight. Together, we are unstoppable! Are you ready? Please call a 
at your earliest convenience. I am so excited to have Tom, Alex, and Quinn from 343 Industries. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Now, I've watched this multiplayer trailer numerous times, and I want to see some specific moments from it so we can break it down. So can we roll the trailer to 15 seconds in, and let's talk about a new character. A new day is upon us. A new generation built to fight. Together, we are unstoppable. Ready. All right, now who is this character? She looks like she's in charge. Uh, your, your, your senses are right there. She's very much in charge. That's Commander Lorette. She's in charge of the Spartan Academy, which is the kind of contextual wrapper that the whole multiplayer universe lives in. She is basically training the new generation of Spartans to you know, become better, and that's really where everything wraps around. Um, I really love this character, and then what's cool is not only is it kind of the contextual wrapper for the game, but it's also we have a whole suite of academy features, we call them, where there's a tutorial that teaches the players the fundamental basics of the game. There's weapon drills that let you practice with every weapon that exists in the game and get improve your skills with those. And then there's a whole thing we call training mode, which lets you play against bots um, on any map, basically, in the game and lets you experiment with the toys and kind of learn the flows of everything. So we really want to bring players on board with the game and, again, under her orders and her charge. Now... I want to go to 50 seconds in the trailer because there was a lot of action going on and I want to check that out. You may have noticed I sat up in my chair a little bit on that one because there was a lot going on there. So please, if you can break that down, let me know what we were seeing. Well, that's, there's a lot to break down. I don't know if we got enough time to get all the way into it. Yeah. Uh, but the some of the, the the things that I really love when I look at that trailer is that that first sequence where the player they have the bulldog shotgun, they're running through shotgunning enemies, they grab the the commando off the off the rack, put some shots in, low sensor like. There's all sorts of different things that the player is interacting with, and that's the sandbox. That's what we call the sandbox, the toys that is at the disposal yeah. for our player's hands. And, and we just really love that, that moment in the trailer where they have the grapple shot, they look up, grapple the ceiling, and then in midair, no scope, snipe an enemy, come all the way down, back whack a foe, and, and then the rest is history as you just see what happened in that trailer. But that's just some of the stuff that, that players can do, and that's actually the game. That's not just a, a movie for cinematic experience. Like, that is the game that if players are good enough, put in time, they can actually do the things that you see in that trailer. Yeah, and few things are more important to Halo multiplayer than, like, interacting with the sandbox and combining it, picking it up off the map and combining it into awesome play styles. So um, what we did was um, every uh, sandbox item in the game, when it spawns, it's spawning on an object in the map so you can see where those things can be found. And then it also tells you the respawn time of that item, when it's going to come back. And you always know, I can go grab that commando over at this uh, spot like that, that guy did. So, and then when the players you know, accrue all those awesome items and do awesome things, you, know, you heard the return of uh, Jeff Steitzer, the multiplayer announcer, uh, shouting out medals. So we always want to give players medals when they do really cool things. So you heard some there, and you'll hear some later on in the trailer. Oh, that's awesome. See, when I watch that, to me, that's Halo. That's mm -hmm. Halo to me. I absolutely love that. Now, let's skip ahead a little bit more into the trailer to 57 seconds. I heard a voice, so I want to know what this voice is. Let's, let's see it. Hello. Let's do some damage. Yeah, so that is the player's uh, personal AI. 
Um, so in Halo 5, they, there was a squad leader that uh, announced, you know, when weapons are going to come up uh, and other things going on in the match. And in Infinite, we have the player, uh, like Chief has Cortana, uh, they have a personal AI in their helmet uh, that is kind of telling them these things. Uh, and it's also another way that players can um, show their personality on their, in their characters. So there's multiple personalities and characters for the uh, player to choose um, so that the, the right AI is right. in their helmet uh, helping them out in combat. I want to skip ahead a little further here because I think I might have saw a big team battle. So, so let's go to a minute 40 in and check that out. Skewer acquired. Grapple check. Claim the enemy flag. Return it to base. Drop inbound. The flag is ours. Please call at your earliest convenience. That looked like big team battle to me. <laughs> what, what, what's coming new? What are we going to do in big team battle in Infinite? I mean, it's not even just that. I mean, part it actually opens with actually a 4v4 with a vehicles map called Behemoth in the, at the beginning. So we, we actually are bringing vehicles back into the 4v4 arena. But then, yes, it definitely transitions into the 4v or the 12v12 actually BTB part of the game where we're actually making it a bigger team battle this time. Really wanting to index into the battle fantasy with the more players. Where instead of like vehicles just spawning around the map, we have pelicans drop them off. We have ordnance pods that drop in new weapons. And inside of that whole time, you have the battle commander, Lorette, talking in your ear, giving you orders and trying to kind of encourage you to play around, but really just bringing the whole sandbox and the play style around this whole battle experience that we're building. Yeah, Tom brings up some good points there of, of uh, Commander Lorette and this, you've, you've got your commander on the comms, and then you've got the pelicans dropping vehicles and items off, you got drop pods, everything. It just is like this, this theater of war that this time around, it, it is this 12v12 bigger team battle, if you will. And just that last, that, that ending segment, which is like a capture the flag match, is just so beautiful and awesome where you've got the Pelican drop the Banshee off, teams fight over it, you're, you're, you and your teammate are just making a beeline for the Banshee, your teammate gets picked off by the sniper, and you're like, oh no, and then you get the skewer, take that sniper out, jump into the Banshee, and you hit the jets and fly up into the sky and go for the enemy flag. That is, that to us is uh, what is so exciting about this version of Big Team Battle with all of the toys, all the vehicles, the modes coming back, the maps, the brand new maps that you see there. I mean, it's it's gonna be an amazing experience. Yeah, uh, trust me, I, I cannot wait to get my hands on it for myself. But let's move on. I wanna go to 208 in the trailer because I, I think I saw a samurai. So let, let's check that out. Let's go to 208 in the trailer. Okay, so I guess next would be a ninja because that was definitely a samurai. So kind of talk about that. So we're going to start seeing some more customization with the armor coming yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, that is a samurai Spartan armor. Yeah. And so it'll be an, a, an armor you'll be able to unlock for free in the first season, which is super cool. Players will be able to equip it, you know, gain more armor pieces and customization options for it, et cetera, across the season. And then we actually have more of this stuff kind of coming down the line. With, there's actually some really cool ideas that we're seeing in uh, that our team that's building that stuff. So there'll be a lot of other cool armors besides just the really core Halo Spartan armors. There'll be some other different kind of twists and things for players to play with. Awesome. Look, now, before we get out of here, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here to, to talk about Halo Infinite. I'm excited. I can't wait to get my hands on it and play it. But before we do leave, is there anything else that you want to bring up and let fans out there know about? Well, I'm excited for people to actually get their hands on it like yourself. So, I mean, if people sign up on our Halos Insiders program, we have in the summer, we have a, uh, uh, a, a technical preview that we're going to be launching. And so people to finally get their, put their hands on the sticks. And I'm just really excited for players to actually finally get to play the game we're working on. Yeah, and then on launch day, Halo Infinite Multiplayer is free to play, which is new to the franchise. The team is super excited uh, to hopefully bring in 
you know, all sorts of fans that have potentially never experienced the franchise or haven't played in a long time to just try it out. Come in and, and try it out with your friends. Me, with my buddies, if I have some friends out yeah. there that haven't played Halo before, I'm like, well, it's free. Just, just come on. Let, let jump in, download it. Let's, let's check it out. And if it's for you, it's for you. If it's not, then, hey, it's not. But I kind of think it'll be for you. So I'm excited for it. Yeah, that's the, the other big key of that point is uh, PC, right? Like, this is, this is a, a PC game as well. We've been putting a lot of effort into that. So not only is it going to be console, but also PC, free-to-play. Like, the barrier to entry is so low, and that has us excited. And I think as we really, just to, to really think about it, is we've been working on this game, and as developers, when you work on a game, you want to get that game out there. And that almost seems like, for us, that's the finish line. But in reality, it's going to be the starting line for, for all of us, for us and the Halo fans. Day one, there's going to be a bunch of content there and things that are exciting and good. But then we're going to add more content. We're going to add more maps. We're going to add more modes and weapons and vehicles, equipment items. And it's just the beginning of this whole journey that, that we've been on for a while. And we're going to take everyone else with us as, we, uh, as the game comes out. I'm excited. Gentlemen, again, thank you so much. Now, for fans who want to learn even more about Halo Infinite multiplayer, check out the brand new deep dive video with the whole multiplayer team over on halowaypoint.com. And allow me to give a big thanks to everyone who's joined us today. Whether you play your favorite games on Xbox, PC, or Game Pass, the next 12 months will be nothing short of spectacular. It has been my absolute honor to be your host and share this experience with you. But before I go, here's a gameplay deep dive from the team behind the highly anticipated Scarlet Nexus. と世界観を表現したあ、世界観を収められたものになってます。はい、この都市はこの世界の中では、あの、あと、今回はセルシェーディングとリアリスティックな背景を合成するような見た目を選んでいるんですけれど、それはまず密度感を表現したいからというのが一つありました。で、ただ単にセルシェーディングのキャラクターをリアリスティックな背景に置いてしまうと、あの、すごく浮いてしまって、見た目が変になってしまうっていうのを懸念してたんですけれど、うまくそこを混ざるように工夫したっていうのが今
でその上で、えっと、私たちの感覚とは違うものを取り入れたいというのがきっかけにありまして、えっと、実際にアーティストの力を借りてこの会議のデザインを再現してますでそのアーティストの表現というのはその美しさがありながらもその死の世界だとかそのネガティブなイメージとポジティブなイメージを一つにしたようなあの幻想的な表現をする作家の方なんですけれどまた彼らの動きについてこだわっているのはあの私たちの知っているような生き物でありそうであれ生き物のようであって私たちと違うものであるっていうのを表現したいっていうのがあったのであの動きの中に一見動物のようで急に違うような動きをするだとか。あの人間のようでいて人間と違うような動きをするだとかそんなモーションを取り込んでますなのでモーションを作る時には人間っぽい部分だけはモーションキャプチャーを使ってるんですけどそうでない部分は手付けなどにしてその人間の動きとそうでない動きをミックスさせることであの不思議な動きにできないかなというのを考えてましたはいえー、まと、あ、もに新入隊員としてこう入隊したキャラクターが2人いるというところで同じ時系列から始まってただその同じ境遇に置かれている一つの物語をそ,のそれぞれの視点から描いていくでそれぞれ視点で描くことで、えーまあ、その時片方の視点には見えなかったあの状況とかを別の視点ではこう楽しんでいただける、まあ、そういうストーリーの楽しみ方を皆さんに提供したいと思って今回2人の主人公を用意しました。そして一人目がこちらですね、えー、ユイとスメラギキャラクターですね彼はですね非常に正義感が強くて、えー、幼い頃に貝飛ばす国自分が貝から救われたっていう経験を持っていてでその経験から自らも、えー、貝飛ばす国志願して入隊したっていうキャラクターになっています、はい、そしてもう一人がこちらのカサネランドールですね、はい、彼女はですね非常に優れた超能力を持っているもうエリートと呼ばれるキャラクターですね。海東伐軍からもスカウトして入隊した非常に優秀なキャラクターです。左側がですね、この重ねの視点ですね。で、右側がユイトの視点でのイベントシーンになっていきますが、今重ねの視点でご覧いただいた通り、ちょっとユイトの姿が見えたりとかしています。で、今重ねの方ですね。一緒に同行しているキャラクター、このキャラクターが。実は未来予知の能力を持っているキャラクターでちょっとこのあユイトたちがやられそうだなっていうのはちょっと分かるようなシーンになっています、まあ、この頃あのユイトの方は今止めてますけどこれはユイトの方では入らずに次のシーンに進んでいきますっていう形で、はい、進んでいくと、えーまあ、こういうふうに貝が降ってきてあ同じようなこう状況に置かれてしまう、まあ、ユイトの方ではこういうふうになってるんだなっていうのは分からずに進んでいきますが重ねの方ではあやっぱりそうなったかっていう形でこう物語が進行していきます、ね、こういうふうにこう同じ一つのシーンでもですねそれぞれがこうまあつながりを持って感じられるそういうふうなストーリーラインを作ろうとして今回のこの企画から今こう発売までっていうところでもうほぼ4年以上かかってるんですけれどもこのストーリーラインというところももちろん企画の最初からこう作っていってはいるんですけど、えー、非常にこの。多くの時間を要していてもうこの2人のこのストーリーこう緻密にこういうふうにこう絡み合ったつながりを持った一つのストーリーとして完成させるまでにやはり2年から3年の、えー、歳月を要しておりますであとはですね、えーまあ、アクションの部分に関しても、えーまあ、開発チームとあーすごく議論して決めてまして特にこの年力アクションもうどういうふうな年力を使えたら皆さんが分かりやすく直感的にこう気持ちよくなってもらえるかっていうところは、まあ、非常にこう開発の中でもですね議論を重ねてできてきた部分がありますのでこの年齢を使うユイトと重ねの,このストーリーですね物語っていうのをぜひ楽しんでもらえればと思います。はい、あの本作はですねあの元々僕があのサイボーグ009とかあのいろんなキャラクターがいろんな能力を使って戦う集団っていうものが大好きで、まあ、そういうその。いろんな能力を使う集団を改めてそのゲーム化したいっていう思いで企画を立ち上げましたあとそのサイキックアクションのもう一つの主軸としてあの SAS というものがありますあの正式名称はストラグルアームズシステムというんですけどそのまあ、仲間キャラクターからその超能力を借り受けるシステムですねその脳を接続して仲間キャラクターから超能力を借り受けることで、まあ、いろんな超能力をユートと重ねは使えるようになります
今画面上ではあの放電の超能力を今使おうとしてるんですけど、まあ、放電の超能力だけに限らず、まあ、瞬間移動とか透明化とか、まあ、ポピュラーで誰しもがその一度は使ってみたいっていう超能力を選定してます。あの本作の,そのキーワードとして赤い線っていうものがあるんですけどあの SAS を使った時にその赤いケーブルが背中に刺さってその戦うことができますのそうですねあの SAS ケーブルデザインする時にそのまあそうですね見た人の,その印象に残ってインパクトに残したいってことはまずあったんですよね。でそういうい時時見た時にあのまあ過去タイトル見た時に例えばキングゲイナーの,その刺さってるケーブルだったりとかあとはそうですねあの、まあ、日本のアニメのガンツなんかもそのケーブルが刺さって戦う様っていうところがすごくクールだったので、まあ、その辺りはそのインスパイアされながらそのデザインっていうものを進めた経緯がありますね。はい、あの本作ですねあの念力で戦うんですけどあの、まあ、単純に投げ飛ばすだけじゃなくてこのロケーションに置いてあるオブジェクトをあのいろいろ活用することができますあの今あの工事現場にあるので工事現場のロケーションなのでダンプを上から落としたんですけど、まあ、そのようにそのロケーションに合ったそのオブジェクトを、まあ、自分なりに扱うことができるってところがはいここはそうですねあのドラム缶をの中から水を出してその貝に貝を水浸しにしてます。でその後そのまあサスの放電で戦うことで水浸しになったその貝を電気でしびれさせるということもできるのでそのまあ超能力燃力とそのサスを組み合わせて戦うというところがまあ一つ特徴となっております。まあしっかり遊びたい人もそのカジュアルに遊びたい人もまあ幅広く楽しめるものとなっております。はいあのプレイヤーはですねあのまあこのようにあのブレインフィールドっていうねその特別な必殺技を使うことができますこれはですねあの海抜群が使うことができる近畿の技で非常に強力なんですけど同時に非常に危険な技でもありますあのユートと重ねがあの展開することでそのまあ、オブジェクトがその空間内に浮き上がってその念力は使い放題になるんですけど一方でその非常に強い負荷が脳にかかってしまいますねなのであのまあ、自分の言動がちょっとおかしなことを言ってしまったりとかあとは聞こえないなあのノ,イズのノイズのような幻聴が聞こえたりとかあとこのようにその途中で頭抱えて動けなくなったりとかすることがあります。で加えてですねあのこの残り時間の秒数があるんですけどこれが制限時間が過ぎるとあのゲームオーバーになってしまうっていう非常に危険な技になっております。はい、なんだけどその非常に危険な技なんですけどそれをうまく使いこなして戦う自分がかっこいいっていうふうな思いをプレイヤーに感じ取ってもらいたいなと思っております。あとそのブレインフィールドあの発動したらフードをかぶってそのたくさんケーブルが刺さった異様な姿になるかなと思うんですけどこれもそのまあダークヒーローっぽいかっこよさがそのまあすごく危険な超能力を自分が扱って戦ってるってところを感じ取ってもらいたくてこのようなデザインにしております。はい、あのこちらのブレインマップと呼ばれるシステムになりますね。あのこちらはあのまあプレイヤーが成長するスキルツリーとなっております。あのこのようにそのちょっとその脳みその形をデザインしたツリーを意識して作っています。で、そのまあ今そうですチャージがため攻撃ができるようになりましたね。あのこのようにそのまあ能力を拡張してその新たなアクションまあこの映像の中ではため攻撃で範囲攻撃をできるようになってるんですけど、まあ、そういったそのアクションの拡張だけじゃなくてその、まあ、念力ゲージが増加する強化系のスキルだったりとかあとはアイテムを使用した後のそのクールタイムが短くなるような補助スキルとかあのまあさまざまないくつかのカテゴリーのスキルを習得することができるようになっています。でその、まあ、脳みそをその脳神経を拡張していくようなあのデザインにこだわっててその、まあ、スキルを選択してボタンをホールドすることでその、まあ、神経が伸びていってそのどんどんどんどんその脳神経が拡張していくようなそういうその体型になることを意識してデザインしております。はい、あのブレインマップ以外ですとあの、まあ、基本的に通常のレベルアップでその敵と戦って経験値を積むことで通常のレベルアップでそのパラメータが底上げされるっていうことに加えて。あの仲間との絆ですね仲間と絆形成することでその絆の力が強くなると絆レベルというものが上がってそのまあ仲間から買い受ける超能力っていうものが強力になってきます。まあ、そのブレインマップと通常のレベルとあとはその仲間との絆を形成して成長させるってところがこの3つがこのゲームの,その成長システムになっております。あの
このゲームその武器と念力の流れ,る流れるようなコンビネーションってところが一つ特徴にしているんですけど、まあ、その流れるようなコンビネーションの体験ってところがシリーズ X だと 60fps で滑らかに体験できるのでその部分はすごくそのリッチな体験になってるなっていうふうに感じます。はいあのー開発チーム一同ねあの、まあ、スタッフ個々が全力で携わったタイトルですのであのぜひ楽しみにしていただけると嬉しいです。From my team and I, please enjoy Scarlet Nexus! <音楽>